Well, good evening. We're going to begin with hymn number 412. Hymn number 412. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, as it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. 412, page 343, standing together as we sing. come before the Lord in a word of prayer together, please. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed as we come into the Master's presence together. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee and we praise Thee that Thou art a God that doth care about the needs of Thine own people. We thank Thee that we are denoted in the Scriptures as the sons, the daughters, the children of the Most High God. We rejoice that we can come before thee as a father, that thou dost draw near unto us in that caring role as well. And, and we thank thee that we as thy people can be brought nearer and nearer and nearer unto thee. We do make it our prayer tonight, nearer my God to thee, nearer to thee. O oh God, we pray that this meeting will be a time even as we sing thy praises, that we would be drawn into the very presence of Almighty God. As we pray together, that we would be very conscious that God, the Holy Ghost, is here in our midst, in filling the people of God to the uttermost, and knowing it, it's a blessed time to be here. And we ask that in all that is said and done, that that help us to exalt the only one that is worthy of being exalted, the Lord Jesus Christ and Christ alone. And we ask that each and every one of us may have that 
that same theme upon our lips, that same desire within our souls, we would see Jesus. Lord, hide this preacher behind the cross. Hide every man and woman behind the cross. And we pray that Christ may be seen in his glory, in his majesty, that we would know him as King of kings and Lord of lords and bow down at his feet tonight, acknowledging that he alone is worthy of praise, he alone is worthy of worship, and he alone is worthy of our total and absolute surrender to his cause and his cause alone. Oh God, we, we come before thee and we acknowledge we, we are nothing, we deserve nothing, we are nobodies, and yet... We thank Thee that now through the precious blood of the Lamb that was shed, that now we can say we are joint heirs with Christ. Now we can say we are the the children of the Most High God. Now we can say because of the blood of Christ, essentially royal blood flows through our veins. And we are now the heirs to eternal life and the glory. How we thank Thee for the privileges we possess in Christ. And, O God, we pray that Thou would help us never to lose sight of who we are as the people of God and the life that is yet to come. Help us not to live for this world. Help us not to live for the pleasures of sin for a season. Help us not to even live for accumulating stuff in this life. But help us to live with an eternal perspective before us, knowing that this life is but a vapor, This life is fleeting, and the world to come, that is what we are living for. That is what we are evangelizing souls for. That is our purpose for what's done for Christ will last. But, O God, we do pray that thou bless us tonight. We pray that you'll help us in in our worship, help us in every aspect of our meeting, as we sing, as we pray, as we preach. We ask that all will be said and done to thine honor and to thy glory alone. But we ask these things in and through the altogether lovely name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Do I have anyone who would like to start us off with a favorite hymn at this stage? 418. 418. And we'll do the first and last verses. 418. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground. Let's make that our prayer tonight, that we would be a people that go forward for God. 418, first and last, keeping our seats. just over the page. I must have the Savior with me, for I dare not walk alone. I must feel his presence near me and his arm around me thrown. First and last, 423.
have another? 631. 631. And we'll do the first and last verses again. 631. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire, uttered or unexpressed, the motion of a hidden fire that trembles in the breast. I'm not sure of this hymn, but I know Peter will find a good tune for us and uh, a beautiful, beautiful sentiment in this hymn. First and last, keeping our seats again. first and last again, 301, and uh, we'll stand together as we sing. I don't think we can sing standing on the promises, sitting down, can we? So we'll stand together as we sing. In fact, we'll do verses 1, 3, and 5 as we stand to sing 301, and let's sing it out with all our hearts. Let's stand together. Standing on the Isn't it tremendous? Perfect, present cleansing in the blood for me. If you're glad of the power of the blood of Christ, say amen. amen. It's good to know it's powerful to wash away sin and powerful to save. We'll sing that third verse again and let's sing it with all our hearts. Standing on the
That's wonderful singing. Now, turning in the Word of God together, please, to the book of James, James chapter 1, and we're going to read the first 12 verses together again, and this is our sixth message thus far in the book of James, and God willing, tonight we're looking at verses 9, 10, and 11 as our text, and we're looking at the title this evening, Financial Temptations. Financial temptations. It's amazing how the Word of God has something to say about everything. And here we find James warns about financial temptations. But at this stage, we'll read these first 12 verses together. James chapter 1, verse 1, the Word of God states, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low. Because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away, for the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. We trust the Lord to bless the public reading of his precious word, to each of our hearts. In the book of James thus far, we've noted various things. Verse 1, we've noted who James was. Uh, more than likely, the half-brother of the Lord, a very eminent character in the New Testament church. We find him in the book of Acts, in the chair, or in the moderator's chair, we could say, at that great presbytery meeting that took place in the book of Acts. And we find it interesting, of all the titles he could have called himself, he finds the lowliest of titles possible to name himself in the verse 1, when he says, a servant, or the word doulos, a slave, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't one to puff himself up, but rather to have a, a meek and lowly spirit. Verse 1, he's writing to the 12 tribes, which are scattered abroad, so that's Jewish Christians that were in his church in Jerusalem that had to flee for their lives, and, and he's writing this general letter, this general epistle to them. In verses 2, 3, and 4, we find he tells to be joyous even in temptation, even in persecution. Why? Because it makes us more Christ-like, makes us more and more like the Savior. Verse 5, tells us what to do in the hard times. What do we do? We pray. We pray in the hard times. Uh, then we find in the verse 6, how to pray. How do we pray? Well, we pray with unwavering faith, don't we? Unwavering faith. You know, they're tremendous truths that, you know, we ought not to skim by, really. In Hebrews 4 and the verse 16, we're told that in all eventualities, the throne of grace is open to the Christian. It says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The throne of grace, the place of prayer is always open and we can ask, we can ask wisdom of God and we find we are to have unwavering faith. Matthew 17 and the verse 20, even if you turn there with me to Matthew 17 and the verse 20, we find the Lord telling of what can be done if a Christian has just a little bit of faith and they're praying in the will of God. Really is quite tremendous what is capable if we pray with unwavering 
faith. Matthew 17 and the verse 20, we find this instance of the disciples not being able to heal this particular individual. Uh, they come to the Lord. The Lord is able to heal uh, this individual. And then in the verse 20 of Matthew 17, the Lord rebukes them and says, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, this is why the disciples couldn't heal them, because of your unbelief. And look what the Lord says, For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And nothing, isn't that tremendous? And nothing shall be impossible unto you. That's tremendous power. The power of unwavering faith and the power that we can tap into in the place of prayer when we're praying in the will of God. Then in James chapter 1 and the verses 6, 7, and 8, we're reminded that the Christian is to be a stable character, a stable character, a steadfast character, unmovable character. This world, this world changes. It's blown about with every wind of doctrine, but believers are meant to be strong. And as we've already sung tonight, standing on the promises that God's Word reveals and not moving from that. We're to be, if you will, uh, stubborn in a holy and a godly way, stubborn in the things that are true. In Galatians 5, in the verse 1, you know these words, it says, stand fast, therefore. It doesn't say compromise to every wind of doctrine. It doesn't say go with a crowd. It doesn't say do what's popular. It says stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Then in Ephesians 6, in the verse 13, it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. What's going on in the majority of churches today? What's going on in, in Christendom, if you want to use it in the most general of senses, right across the world? The world is coming into the church, is it not? It's worldliness in the church. And Christianity, or so-called Christianity, is moving, is changing, is, on, is rather than being unwavering, is continually wavering. We're told to withstand, and having done all, to stand. We don't move. We keep standing. And that's what James has already dealt with. Now in verses 9, 10, and 11, we find, I suppose you could say, a new subject, but a new subject with an old theme. A new subject with an old theme. And we're on the theme, you could say, of temptation, and that is the theme of the verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers or various temptations... But it's got a new subject within that theme of temptation. And it's financial temptations. Financial temptations. Let's look at verses 9, 10, and 11 again. It says, Let the brother of low degree rejoice when he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low. Because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of, her, of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Now, I'll be honest with you. I don't know if James had any, anyone in particular in mind when he was writing this. I'd imagine he probably did. <laughs> Most preachers do when they say things, especially of this ilk. And, and I can imagine James thinking of maybe a particular individual. Maybe, maybe there's been a, a lowly individual, a poor individual financially, or, or lowly by this world's goods, and, and suddenly they've been elevated to great wealth, or maybe the opposite way around. Maybe someone that had great wealth, and suddenly they've been brought low. But here we find James speaking, even though we're not given the specifics as to who they are or what the situation was or any of these things, but he wants to make something clear when he writes that even if your financial status or your worldly possessions change, your faith ought not to ever change. 
Your walk with God ought to never change. You ought to be able to go on with God just the same whether you're poor or whether you're a multimillionaire. You ought to be able to continue going on with God. You see, money is one of those taboo subjects in society, isn't it? I know when I was a joiner, <laughs> I didn't mind going into people's houses. I didn't mind doing a job. I didn't mind working for weeks. But you know, one thing I hated Maybe some of you wonder what I'm talking about. Maybe you say, oh, I don't mind this bit. But the one bit I hated was asking for the money at the end of it. I hated that bit because it's a taboo subject, money, isn't it? Well, James, James starts to talk about how we are to have a spiritual walk even in regard to financial matters. And ultimately, we find that there are two main things, I believe, that can destroy a church, destroy a ministry, destroy a, a local personal testimony, and that's money and relationships. Money and relationships. You want to see something that can destroy and harm the work of God at a breakneck speed, it is money and relationships. Those two items. And we've got to be careful over those two things, especially, uh, come with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and the verse 10. And I would urge it, and we, we do our best, I know, and, and we, we do our utmost in this as, as a committee, even in this place. With money, it is, it is always best policy to be transparent, completely transparent, not hiding anything, not keeping anything from the side, or even, I'll say this, keeping anything on the side from the tax man, anything like that. The Christian is to be completely transparent. And certainly, we need money to live and exist, but we are not to love money. Look what it says in 1 Timothy 6 and the verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. You know, you often hear that misquoted. I'm sure you've heard it, where people say money is the root. It's not. Money is not the root of all evil. You need money to exist. If you don't have money, you won't have food on the table tomorrow. That's just the, the reality of the situation. But the love of money, the desire for it, the ambition for it, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, look at the verse 10, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You say, is, is Paul right when he, is he correct when he writes to Timothy? He is. I've seen that. I've seen people lose their testimony over the head of trying to find and scrape the next penny. I've seen it. I know it. It's true. They have erred from the faith, piercing themselves through with many sorrows. But I also said there's another thing. Uh, come with me to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6 and verses 32 and 33. Money and relationships. Those two things can be the downfall of the witness of God in a local church, in a minister's life, in a Christian's personal testimony. And we have to be so very careful about both of these things. These are the things that have been the master strokes of the devil time and time and time again to do harm to the work of God. And it says in Proverbs 6 and verse 32, look at it with me. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. How many times have we seen, especially among celebrity, so-called celebrity TV evangelists, people like that, and, and they're caught in this snare of adultery, and everything goes down the tube. And, and it is a reputation that cannot be cleaned, shall not be wiped away. You know, the Scripture's always right. We've got to be careful on these issues. And we find that James deals with both of them in his book. James is a man that, that, that has no problem in, in he doesn't hold his, his punches in that sense. He, he goes to town on what he thinks needs to be dealt with, and he deals with with the issue of financial temptations in verses 9 through to 11. And I find it incredible. I really do. 
There's people that will try and tell you that the book, the Word of God, is old-fashioned, it's dated, it's not up-to-date. Friend, this book is more up-to-date than tomorrow's newspaper. It has something about everything, and we are to know it. So we're going to look at this warning about financial temptations. Now look at the verse 9. I find this encouraging. Look what it says. Let the brother, let the brother. Now isn't that a tremendous start? Let the brother of low degree, and in reference to the verse 10, let the brother that is rich. Isn't it a tremendous sentiment that James begins this whole affair with with the word brother? It's an encouragement that whatever your financial status, you can be a part of the family of God. You can be a child of God. You can have spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ, whether you're poor and lowly. Come with me to Proverbs Uh, 28. Look at Proverbs 28 with me, please. Maybe you're one and you feel, I don't have a penny to my name. I'm scraping it all together. I'm just barely getting by. Well, isn't it tremendous to know that the Lord cares about us? We are part of that great heavenly family, and the Lord is King of kings and Lord of lords is not just interested in the elite or the established or the statesmen or the millionaires of this world. No, rather he's interested in the lowly. That's a tremendous encouragement. It says in Proverbs 28, look at the verse 6, Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. The Lord would rather see you a beggar and godly than rich and reprobate. You know that? He'd rather see you a beggar and walking with him and walking in uprightness. Come with me to uh, Proverbs 17 and the verse 5. Proverbs 17 and the verse 5. And we find not only is the Lord welcoming the pauper into his family, which really is tremendous, but also the Lord is one that is willing to defend the poor as well. And it says in chapter 17 and the verse 5, Whoso mocketh the poor reproacheth his maker. And he that is glad of calamities shall not be unpunished. The Lord defends the poor. He defends those that financially aren't as well off, if you will. Then in Luke chapter 6, we read something similar again. Luke chapter 6, and look at the verses 20 and 21. And it's tremendous. It tells us there, and this is the Lord Jesus himself speaking in Luke chapter 6 and the verse 20. Luke 6 and the verse 20, it says, And he lift up his eyes on his disciples and said, So the Lord is speaking, and he says, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Isn't that a tremendous promise? Maybe you're one and you're struggling. You're struggling. Well, listen, there's coming a day when you'll be rich beyond compare as you inherit the glory forever with the Lord. One day you will never hunger again and ye shall be filled. So even if you have a, don't have a penny to your name, the Lord is happy to bring you into the family of God and give you an inheritance. But also the rich, the rich. And this is something... Maybe you're here and you say, well, this isn't a word for me now. <laughs> I'm not rich. Well, I don't know sometimes. But I'll tell you this, the Lord is more than willing to accept the rich that come to him as well. And you say, really? Is that the case? Well, look at 1 Timothy in chapter 6 again. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we've already looked a little at one of the verses, but it's tremendous. But I will say this, if one has money and has finances and has things like that, the Lord has a a very serious obligation for those individuals. And it says in 1 Timothy 6, look at the verse 17, it says, charge them that are rich in this world. That's very interesting. This is a word to the child of God. It's a word to the Christian. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. So we find to be a Christian and to be rich, it isn't incompatible, but it goes on. Trust in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good 
that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. And we find if, if there be one and they are rich and they're a child of God, then the Lord says there's a duty there to distribute, to use that as, and to be a steward of that. And it's a tremendous blessing that you may have been given, but you're to use it for the furtherance of God's work and witness, and you're to do it laying up, laying up with eternal life in view. Really is tremendous. It's not impossible to be rich and to be saved. And, and you could argue the point from patterns in Scripture. Abraham, Abraham was rich, wasn't he? I don't know if you knew that. In Genesis 13, we read in the verse 2 that Abraham was rich. It says, and Abraham was very rich. Very rich. It wasn't just rich. It was very rich. I don't know if anyone fits the bill of that today, but, but Abraham was very rich. And it says, in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Jacob was rich as well. In Genesis 30, Genesis 30, in the verse 43, it says, And the man increased exceedingly, and had much cattle, and maid servants, and men servants, and camels, and asses. We read that Solomon was rich. He, he, he exceeded all the other kings of Israel and Judah at that time for wealth. Job was rich. Job was the greatest of men financially, but it didn't mean it was incompatible with salvation because we also find that even though he was the greatest of all the men of the East, we read that Job was a man perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. So you see, we have there different types of believers, different types of people financially James is talking about. And it's not impossible even when the Lord says about, it is, uh, well, come with me there to, to Matthew. Come with me to Matthew. I want you to see this, actually. Matthew 19. Because maybe you have a question mark still in your mind. I want to address it. Matthew 19. Look at the verses 23 and 24. Because you'll remember there was the rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler chose his riches ahead of Christ, didn't he? And he was sad. He went away sad because we read at the end of the verse 22, he was sorrowful for he had great possessions. He was sad because he didn't want to give it away for the cause of Christ. It says in the verse 23, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, we find it very interesting. That doesn't mean it's impossible for a rich man to be saved because in the verse 23, the Lord put in the word hardly, hardly, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the Lord, it's very interesting actually in Mark chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, we find that defined even further. The difference being in Mark 10 and the verse 24, it says their children, how hard is it for them the trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? You see, that's the difference. You can have riches and still trust in the living God, but if you're trusting in your riches, then it's impossible to get into the kingdom of God. So you say, why have I laid all this ground? Why have I laid all this foundation in a large way when coming to James chapter 1 and the verses 9 and 10 and 11? Well, very simply because James is talking about financial temptations. There's no doubt about it that there's some Christians that are poor, some Christians that are rich. To be financially rich or to be financially poor, none of it is incompatible with being saved or being a Christian. But then we find these warnings. Look at the verse 9 of James 1. It says, Let the brother of low degree, so the pauper, the, the brother of low degree, rejoice in that he is exalted. So we find now there's this warning when a man goes from poverty to riches very, very quickly, this warning of it going to his head and, and turning him away from God. Then in the verse 10, we read, but the rich man in that he is made low. And we find then another warning. There's also the warning of the man that goes from great riches to great poverty for whatever reason, very quickly, and that can turn him away from God. 
Now, I don't know the specifics of what James is referring to when when writing to his congregation that are persecuted and spread abroad, but something is in his mind that some financial happening has taken place, and he's warning them, don't let it take you away from the faith. Don't let money be that which parts you from the true and living God. And then in the verses 10 and 11, James makes a a big deal of it, a big deal of emphasizing that money perishes. Money is not forever. Finances change. This world is not reliable. It says in the verse 10, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Now James really labors the point that, listen, whatever changes may take place in your finances, you keep trusting God no matter what. Because money... Money, that's just something that helps us to survive. But don't pin your entire hopes on it because it perishes. It's not forever. This world is not forever. There are more important things. And come with me to James chapter 1 and verse 17. He's getting their eye on something. He's looking them or pointing them to look toward God, the provider of all things. He says in the verse 17, Every good and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. How often when men get riches or when men lose riches, do they take their eye on the one that gave it all in the first place? James is reminding them, Every good and perfect gift is from above. And look at the verses 2, uh, verse 2 initially. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations. Verse 12, the other end of this, like, like two bookends, sandwiching all this together. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Here we find financial temptations, enduring even this aspect of our temptations. Because it comes. Because it comes. It always does. And James is emphasizing there's more important things. You know what Bibles emphasize? There's more important things than money in this world. Now, of course, there's the obvious. There's Christ. Eternal life. We'll come to that. But even other things. Other things in life. Far more important than money. Far more important And if you have it, you're rich, friend. You really are. Come with me to Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. And I know myself in recent times, I I suppose myself, I've I've gotten a grasp and my eyes open to, to these verses without trying to embarrass anybody. But having a wonderful companion, having somebody there that that is of like mind and like precious faith and will support you and and help you as a a, a help meet. Look at Proverbs 31 in the verse 10. It says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. You see that? You see that? Something far greater than financial success or riches in this life. It says, look at the verse 11, The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that He shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. I know there's some of you here and you can say, yes, I've had that. I've known that. I've experienced that. Her price is far above rubies. Come with me to Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22 and the verse 1. I want you to see something else that we are to note is far more important than financial success. Whether we be poor or whether we be rich, there's something else that is far more important than that. And that's our testimony. That's our reputation in this world. It says in Proverbs 22 in the verse 1, look at it. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Friend, it's better to have a good testimony than to have a good bank account. You know that? A lot of people miss out on that too. Too busy. You see it on the Lord's Day. Lord's Day, working away now, laboring as if it were any other day. What are they doing? Trying to increase the bank account. 
trying to increase the bank account, and many Christians have thrown their testimony away for the chase of just a few more pounds and pennies. It's tragic. A good name, a good name is better be chosen, rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor, rather than silver and gold. But then come with me to Psalm 62. Psalm 62 and the verse 10. And we find that, of course, there's different things I could turn you to that are all better than riches in this life, by the way. But of course, there's the Lord. Eternity. Sins forgiven. Redemption. Of course, they must be. They have to be better than redemption. Oh, friend, if if you were to lose every penny tonight, like Job, but say, I still have Christ, I, I know that my Redeemer liveth, surely we can still press on. We can still keep going, knowing that Christ is ours, and we are His. Psalm 62 in the verse 10, it says, Trust not in oppression, and become not vain in robbery. Look what it says. This is a warning. If riches increase, Set not your heart upon them. Set not your heart upon them. Come with me to Ephesians 1 and the verse 11. It tells us why. Ephesians 1 and the verse 11, because however much riches can increase in this life, even if there was to be some tremendous windfall tomorrow, I want to tell you this, still it would be as nothing in comparison to the riches we are going to inherit in the glory. And that's what we need to keep our focus on, the inheritance with the Lord for all eternity because of the blood shed and the blood applied. And Ephesians 1 and verse 11 says, In whom? In Christ. In the one that the verse 7 says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Verse 11, In whom also we have obtained. Isn't that interesting? That's written in the past tense. Well worth highlighting. Obtained. doesn't say we're going to obtain it. It says we've already obtained it. We have it. It's ours. Eternal security. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. It's tremendous. You know, I think so many believers can come, like in James's day, and have their, their eyes lowered. Instead of looking up on eternal matters, they, they've got their eyes down below on all of the world's materialism and money and work and everything like that, or that we would keep our eyes on what is important. But then look at the verse 9 of James 1 again. Uh, James 1 and the verse 9 says, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Now, of course, it can refer to the pauper getting rich very quickly, but also commentators, and commentators debate the issue, but some believe James is talking about the brother of low degree, the pauper, the penniless individual, but then rejoice in that he is exalted. You see, even though you may have nothing spiritually, you can be rich. Uh, even though you have nothing physically, rather, you can be rich spiritually. You can be a rich man spiritually. You can be enjoying a greater measure of the riches of God's grace, even though you may not have a penny to your name. And you can rejoice in that. Rejoice in that he is exalted, even in the sight of Almighty God. We see that in 1 Corinthians 1. I'll just read it to you. It says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given uh, given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him. Enriched by him. You know, this verse doesn't have to just be talking about material finances. You can be enriched in Christ, even if you don't have a penny. But then the same on the other turn in the verse 10, but the rich in that he is made low. Oh, you can be wealthy. You can have money. But you can be spiritually a pauper, missing out on the riches of God's grace. Come with me again to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 is, by the way, a tremendous and very practical chapter in regarding Christian finance. I would encourage you in those things. You know, I've I said it already tonight, but, but people think the Bible doesn't have answers. The Bible has answers for everything. The Bible has an answer about how a nation's economy should be run. 
You know that? The Word of God has advice for how an individual's home budget should be run. The Word of God has answers for how an individual shouldn't be in debt, and the individual that is in debt is a slave to the one giving the debt, and all those things. The Word of God has something to say about it all, financially, as well as everything else. But 1 Timothy 6, look at the verse 8. It says, And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich, and we find something very interesting, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. What's a snare? It's a trap. It's a hunting trap. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men, drown men in destruction and perdition. I want you to look in this way a moment. You ever thought about thanking God that you're penniless? <laughs> Maybe that's something that goes against the grain. Thanking God that you don't have a ton of money. Because look what it says there. There are, there are additional temptations for the man with money. Hurtful temptations, things that will lure you away from the faith, foolish and hurtful loss, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Don't think that even something like your finances is an accident. We believe in a sovereign God. We believe in a God that is in complete and absolute control. And whatever, so wherever you may be financially, because James brings it up here, it's the only reason why we're talking about it tonight, but whatever position you may be in financially, I want to assure you, uh, it doesn't hinder redemption. It doesn't. Proverbs 22, and the verse 2 says, The rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. But there's greater temptations for one and the other. And the point that James is making here is this. And this is the point I leave with you tonight. Verses 10 and 11. Riches pass away. Money pass away. But the faith that is found in and through the Lord Jesus Christ never passes away. And friend, it is better to be rich in God's grace than to be rich financially without the Savior and without having a proper walk with God. Come with me to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3. And we'll just look at two more references before we finish. 2 Peter 3 and look at the verses 6 and 7. And we're reminded here, because I think sometimes we forget this, we're reminded that even though, and it's wise and it's prudent to look after the future or retirement or any of those things, I'm not outdoing any of that, I'm not. If you think that's the case, then you're misunderstanding me. But the point is, money and all the material things of this world, it's all going to burn up one day. It's all going to be burnt up. It says in 2 Peter 3 in the verse 6, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. What's that talking about? Talking about Noah and the flood all the way back in the book of Genesis. You know about it. And look what it says in comparison to that, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, right now, in 2024, what's it say? By the same word are kept in store. So we find they're only here because God has kept them. And look what it says, verse 7. Reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. One day this world and everything therein is going to be burnt up with fire, and then there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Then the saints will inherit the earth. But friend, all that we know at this moment, it will burn up. Come over a few more pages to 1 John, or just over a page, to 1 John chapter 2, and the verse 17 and we find the Lord makes it perfectly clear on this front what is important, what is not important. And it says in 1 John 2 and the verse 17, And the world passeth away, and the loss thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So what's James saying when we come back to James 1 and verses 9, 10, and 11? He's talking about another type of temptation, financial temptation, that whatever your position may be in, don't forget the Lord. Be enriched 
in his grace and just trust the Lord with the rest. That's not always easy. It's easier said than done. But remember this, all the things of this world is going to burn up with a burning heat. So don't let these things take you away from the Lord. And verse 12 sums it all up. Blessed is the man that endureth. Endure this. Endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he, re he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. We trust the Lord to bless his word to each of our hearts for his own name's sake. Hymn number 401, please. Hymn number 401. And this is a lovely hymn reminding us even of the themes we've looked at and come across in this series in the book of James. In land or store I may be poor, my place unknown, my name obscure. Of this I have the witness sure, O oh, bless the Lord, I have Jesus. If you have Christ, you're, you're rich beyond compare. Remember that. For though the world its gifts deny, I've riches more than gold can buy. The key to treasures in the sky. Oh, bless the Lord. I've Jesus. 401 will stand as we sing.